Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is David Hendricks, and I'm a former engineer over at Facebook. And this is my colleague, Andrea Barberio. And we're going to talk today about open source firmware at Facebook. Uh, so I'll start by giving a quick overview, and then Andrea will uh, finish with a whole bunch of demos. So, so when you think about open source firmware at Facebook, you might think of our involvement with a lot of software projects, um, yeah, like the Linux kernel, CentOS, Chef, um, and in fact, in 2018, Facebook was the fifth most active contributor to open source projects on GitHub, uh, fifth most active corporate contributor that is. Uh, however, we're also involved in open source hardware. So a few years ago, we started the Open Compute Project, uh, which aims to, uh, which Steve talked about yesterday during a lightning talk, and that aims to bring the same kind of innovation that we see in the software world to the hardware world. And we also uh, we started the Telecom Infrastructure Project to similarly accelerate the pace of innovation in the telecom industry. Uh, today, Open Compute Project has over 100 members, and Telecom Infrastructure has uh, Telecom Infrastructure Project has over 500 members. So these are big industry-wide initiatives. And a few years ago, we started. Uh, there you go. Thank you. You have to also get it up with you. Oh, cool. Thank you. So. Uh, so we also started working on open source firmware. Uh, a few years ago, Facebook engineers identified proprietary BMC firmware as a pain point for our operations. The BMC, or Baseboard Management Controller, is an independent microcontroller present in many server and networking platforms that typically performs uh, monitoring and management functions. Our engineers uh, were unsatisfied with the proprietary solutions at the time and decided to implement one based on Yocto, and that was released as OpenBMC in 2015. So with the BMC firmware finally opened up and open BMC becoming the standard on most of the equipment, system firmware became the next one to step. So what is system firmware? So system firmware is the first bit of code that runs when your processor is turned on. It's sometimes referred to as BIOS, but that's kind of a legacy term. It has knowledge of the system as a whole and, uh, and so that it can initialize all the cores on all the sockets and find all the devices and all the buses and you know, to set everything up basically so that you can run sane, normal code and actually boot into your operating system. Um, so code running this early has to do with a few interesting constraints that application developers typically don't have to worry about. So for example, when your processor starts up, you don't have caches, you don't have DRAM, <laughs> you don't have a stack, you don't have a heap. All this stuff has to be set up. And then once you do get it all set up, then there's the fun part of initializing all the devices, you know, SSDs, networking devices, and so on, so that you can actually load what you want to load and execute, namely your target operating system. Simple, right? So a couple examples of how this has gotten a little bit more complex over the years. Uh, let's take a simple act of booting over a local storage device. So many years ago, a couple decades ago, you might have had you know, one de facto standard device. These days, the sheer quantity has exploded and we have many more devices, you know, rather than just, you know, one type of uh, serial interface, now you have, you know, all, all these uh, other things, SSDs, uh, EMMCs, pluggable devices, and so on. Um, we have many generations of interfaces and protocols, controllers, and devices from countless vendors that we need to support. Um, we have high speed links these days. Used to be, you'd flip the power, and that was a, all the training you have to do, basically. Uh, these days, you turn on the power, probe its capabilities, ramp up the speed. Um, you may need to configure power and clock trees along the way, and that involves a lot more knowledge of the system as a whole. And finally, once you get to the point where you can actually communicate to the device, then you need to actually load something and execute it. And the old way you do that with the master boot record scheme is you would take the first thing you could find on uh, cylinder head sector 001, and you would blindly execute it. Uh, that's pretty terrible by today's standards. Um, these days, you might want to go through a whole bunch of different devices, pick a partition more intelligently. You might have to decrypt, uh, like open up a decry uh, encrypted partition. You might want to ver verify the thing you're going to execute. You know, just some basic sanity checks. So, uh, so on to network booting. So network booting used to mean that you would load an OS image from the server across the room, probably on the same way. Uh, the way network booting evolved was built around trusted networks. Uh, however, these days, we, we want to be able to load an operating system 
image from over a network uh, that might reach out to a whole other data center, or perhaps somewhere else over the open web, just completely untrusted networks. So, like storage, there are many more devices, interfaces, and protocols with varying levels of complexity, robustness, and security. Uh, current network, network booting technology was you know, mostly designed in the 80s and 90s and hasn't really changed a whole lot uh, in terms of things like Pixie Boot. Um, Pixie Boot relies on TFTP, which uh, has basically no security built in, and you certainly wouldn't want to send your credit card information over the open web using TFTP. You definitely don't want to boot your infrastructure that way. So it's time we use protocols that were designed with security in mind and robustness, things like HTTPS and even torrents. So long story short is that booting has gotten pretty complex, and consequently, system firmware has gotten much more complex as well. Uh, system firmware these days has its own drivers, network stack, crypto libraries, shell applications, graphics drivers, and so on. And uh, our philosophy is that if we're going to have an OS and firmware, let's make it Linux. So for us at Facebook, at least, Linux is very familiar to us, and I'm sure it's very familiar to a lot of you as well. Uh, we have teams of engineers who are supporting Linux at all levels, uh, kernel, tools, services, etc. cetera. Uh, we want the debuggability and traceability of using open source software. And um, keep in mind that this is code that runs at the highest privilege level and has unlimited access to your storage and networking resources. So we really need to know what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, for tooling, uh, we want we want to go from vendor-specific and sometimes product-specific tools to open tools. A good example of this is think of how you update the firmware on your uh, on your laptop. You might have to run some vendor-specific utility that, if you ran it on someone else's laptop, would probably result in them getting a brick or worse, um, or maybe it just wouldn't run. But we want open generic tools, and we want firmware that can be ported across a wide range of systems, including servers, networking appliances, and embedded platforms. We don't want to have to support 10 different firmwares on all the, you know, <coughs> on 10 different devices that go into our data centers. So, long story short is we want to let Linux do as much of this as possible because Linux, of course, runs everywhere and it can be common across a wide variety of platforms. Uh, the approach for taking is called Linux Boot, and here's a brief overview. Uh, so, the main idea of Linux boot is to put Linux with an embedded environment like an inner RAM FS uh, in the boot ROM and jump to it as soon as you've got the CPU and DRAM initialized and you're ready to actually run the same normal code. Once we're, in our case, we're using Corbin to do the silicon initialization. Uh, some of you may have heard of Corbin. And uh, we, we try to keep that as minimal as possible because we want to offload as much as possible to Linux. Uh, we look, once we have Linux loaded, we let Linux initialize storage and networking resources, and we reuse tools from user space to carry out the remaining steps. So by doing this, we're able to get rid of a whole lot of stuff that's <coughs> shipped in firmware and replace it with uh, code that we're already using in user space and in kernel space. So this gives us the same production quality drivers, apps, and networking facilities that we're used to in supporting the runtime environment. And of course, there are many other benefits that we don't really have time to get into, uh, but we'll be happy to discuss later on. So just to drive the point home, this is what it, Facebook infrastructure looks like today. Uh, some of you dropped by the booth at the table yesterday over in building AW. Uh, thank you very much for visiting. Um, but some people were asking, hey, why does Facebook care about this? And well, this is why. Uh, even though our data is in the cloud, this is our cloud. Uh, <laughs> we physically have you know, at least a dozen of these sites, and uh, they're just packed with servers, and we actually have to maintain this stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's a lot of servers and switches. And uh, we're not just building data centers, so uh, here's some example of open cellular hardware that we're uh, producing and, and shipping out to various parts of the world. Uh, open cellular is part of the, open, uh, the telecom infrastructure project, um, with the goal of improving communications infrastructure. So, yes, the data is in the cloud, but it's our cloud, and at the end of the day, it's our responsibility. Uh, the cloud consists of many data centers, packed with servers, packed with equipment, and um, yeah, we have a pretty large infrastructure, but so does Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and all the other hyperscalers. So, 
At the end of the day, everything that runs on our servers is our problem, including firmware, and we need the ability to debug, audit, patch, secure it, and deploy it. So in the 2018 Open Compute Project officially kicked off the Open System Firmware Initiative uh, within OCP with the goal of opening up firmware that goes into our data centers, similarly to the way we're using open source software and open source hardware. Uh, as part of this effort, even Microsoft has been working with, the, with us, uh, and they, they have a slightly different work stream called Open EDK, so that's more on the pure UEFI path, but that's your thing. Uh, while Google and Facebook are working more on Linux boot. And of course we have many other partners in this ecosystem. In both cases, open source firmware enables us to support our company's use cases with open, portable, and auditable firmware and tools that are well understood and actively developed within our respective communities and companies. And here to demonstrate how we're going about this is Andre. <coughs> So, uh, I'm going to show a hands-on on Linux boot. Uh, it's going to be a live demo. Uh, live demos can uh, go well and fail in some way, so it's good for gaming. Uh, short introduction, I work in the test production engineer. We work on reliability and performance and security of the infra, and I work specifically on the provisioning of Linux boot. Uh, before we start, I want to show you what's the very high level, what's the uh, architecture we use for Linux boot and Facebook. Uh, on the left side, you can see that's true. <laughs> on the left side, you can see that uh, what runs on the flash chip. There's actually a picture of the flash chip on top. Uh, and on the right side, you can see what boots from the hard drive. So all of this is basically soldered on the motherboard. What we are doing is, as I suggested, uh, we are replacing an operating system with an operating system. And this last one is Linux. On the left side, uh, the main component, uh, the first component is Core Boot, which is able to do hardware initialization, the very basic hardware initialization, uh, CPU, uh, VRAM, and so on. Uh, then we have Linux, which provides us with uh, usual uh, make drivers, spot systems, uh, all the familiar uh, things we know, uh, and discuss the environment, separation between internal and user space, and so on. On the right side, which is the button I'm going to focus on on the rest uh, of the demo, uh, is the user space. This user space is made not mainly, uh, is it's based on top of your root, which is an uh, environment for embedded systems entirely ready to go. started at Google and which we have contributed to. Uh, and uh, with a set of additional tools that we call system boots that are adding uh, bootloader behavior uh, on your root. So uh, let's go uh, back to the live demo. system, and we are also importing an external thing that is the system boot thing that I mentioned, 
which is able to uh, behave as a controller. Now, I'm pressing enter, and uh, this is gonna build the whole system, compile everything, create CPIO uh, archive, and that archive will be useful directly into a Linux kernel as uh, your uh, manifest. Uh, it's pretty fast, it usually takes, yes, you can see that with a bunch of tools, it takes 15 seconds, uh, which if you are familiar with other systems, is pretty fast. Uh, and this generated the manifest. Since we don't have much time, I'm gonna just go quickly through it. Uh, this will compress, the next script will compress the manifest, will build the kernel, and will build for boot. And this is gonna take a bit, so I will give a bit more details about you while it builds. Uh, so your root, as I said, it's a, it's a product that we Google to give, uh, to provide a uh, environment for embedded systems. Uh, it's entirely going to go for the benefits that I mentioned above. Uh, and uh, has two interesting modes of build. One is called VisiBox mode, uh, which uh, you can easily imagine what it is. And the other one is the source mode. VisiBox mode, if you're familiar with VisiBox, will take all the source code, will compile it into one single binary after rewriting everything into one single source, and it will generate one binary. This is great for saving space. Yeah, even the building here. <coughs> the source mode is even more interesting. So instead of having one binary on your firmware, and remember that here we're talking about firmware, not hard drive. It's not the target operating system. It's on your motherboard. Uh, the source mode will embed the source code of your programs, like LSPS and so on, uh, and a go compiler. And everything will run live, uh, will be compiled on the fly on your machine. For example, when you boot your firmware, and instead of uh, you interrupt it and enter the shell. When you run LS, it will pull the go compiler, will build it on the fly, and will execute it. The next time it will be cached and it will be fast. If you make any modification to your program because you want to do debugging, because you want to understand why it's not working and so on, you can just modify it on the film itself, <coughs> rerun the command, it will get rebuilt, and then you can troubleshoot and verify whether your uh, uh, what you thought was broken in this way, whether your fix works. When you reboot the machine, uh, you go back to Kingsley. All right, so now I'm going to run all of this. Uh, we are going to do a demo on QAMO because it's what we need to practice to bring uh, real uh, switches and servers here. Uh, but this works exactly the same way. Uh, the QAMO system has a firmware, which you can call with dash BIOS, as you can see here. Uh, it has hard drives and it has a network. And in this case, I have set up the demo with a network uh, that has another machine with DHCP, uh, HTTP server, uh, all the IPv6 uh, environment that you need require for boot advertisement, etc. Uh, and this will spin up a virtual machine with our firmware, the one that we just built a few moments ago. I'm going to run the script. Password is positive, of course. And I'm going to stop here. So, this is the filter. It's already ready to boot your machine and to boot your operating system, but I interrupted it. Uh, where you see, stop in boot sequence, press control C within five seconds to drop into shell. Here you are again in the filter, not in the target device. And you can run commands like ls, you can see the network configuration, you can check. Uh, your network the neighbors, you can do, well, there's no at the moment, but you can basically have a proper Linux environment where you can run commands and troubleshoot whether and why your machine doesn't work. Uh, so this was very fast, so I can scroll back and show you that since the moment we put it here, uh, we start with Corboot. Corboot does its job uh, by, by initializing memory. And then you see these messages. And, uh, it will scan the PCI bus and you get the USB device, the disk, the packet, and so on. And then you get into the Euro running text, which creates the structure of your file system, which has all the problems that you have embedded, focus uh, on the problems that you have in memory. Here, eventually handles the control of the output folder, which we call system boot. System boot is just a collection of binaries and programs that are able to boot a machine. I'm going to show how does the network program work. It's just a little command, 
simulated resilience command of the running server. Uh, it's able to do it by DHP or by a slot without DHP or from a hot code URL without DNS, etc. There are several different ways you can put it. Uh, I am going to simply put uh, in the button so you can see the messages. Uh, and this is going to try to get a configuration by DHCP, uh, a network boot program. Uh, and I should get check. Uh, you will get a network boot program. <coughs> And uh, yes, that's what I was Okay, uh, I was working on this demo for uh, to show something else, so I am running with a different config. But here you can see that we got the IP address, for example. Anyway, now the HTTP, I just reconfigured the HTTP to boot from the network. I'm going to try it now. So that demo by so it gets the, uh, the configuration, it gets the network, network boot program, and then it boots into our installer. Here is just a dummy installer. It's just here to prove the point. It's not really installing anything on the machine. It will take too much time. But it's proving that it booted by HTTP, not by HTTP. And you can even boot by a torrent. We are working on torrent, but unfortunately, I couldn't make it in time for the demo. Uh, you can literally pass a magnet link in the HTTP and boot your very large image. <laughs> and yes, it, it works in here. So, let's imagine, yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, I should move on to questions now. All right. Uh, let's switch to question. And while we switch to questions, I will just show that the people yeah. So, so questions, hands up. Uh, how are we doing open source firmware at Facebook? Again, this is all open, and we encourage you to come, come along and uh, join the community and uh, download the code and try it out. Uh, and, of course, try out free BSD boot or Plan 9 boot or whatever else you want. All right, questions? Yeah, what is the status for ARM64? So um, in the original slides that I saw for um, Linux boot, it was saying it was thinking about using reboot SPL for starting ARM boards. Or what has happened in this area? Uh, so there hasn't been a whole lot of movement there, but uh, the good news is that you know Linux runs pretty well on ARM boards, and uh, recompiling this in ARM64 is simple. <coughs> we just have to set go arc equals ARM64. This uh, all compiles trivially. Uh, we actually tested that beforehand, but didn't have time to show the demo. Um, uh, yeah, if, if someone from the U boot community would like to uh, lead this and you know, go straight from SPL to Linux boot, that would be awesome. Next question. Uh, yeah, uh, has this been tried on uh, workstation for this? Uh, yeah, well, well, we're trying to find uh, production hardware, so switchers and servers. The only requirement is that your laptop has the support for boot uh, and you have to be able to refresh it. For example, I use Linux a lot and it's a perfect platform for uh, refreshing the Linux boot. Uh, what about options on uh, uh, like normal PC motherboards that require like, uh, multiple enhancement? Uh, 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 it's a more complicated it's question. Let's catch up after the stuff. Okay. One more question. Um, normally, the firm will provide services like uh, plan management and things. Who's doing that yeah. in those cases? Is the hardware simply doing it or in your uh, case? So, the question was about uh, certain runtime services that the firm might be involved with, such as fan management. Uh, for our case, uh, since, just since we're just using open computer project for this, the fans are managed by the BMC. It's kind of a cop out answer. Uh, but yeah. for the laptop or workstation case you mentioned? Uh, so that's typically done by an embedded controller. Um, but uh, if you do need to implement things like system management mode routines in order to handle stuff, uh, Ron Minnick did a really cool talk called um, Let's Move SMI into the Kernel or something like that. And uh, so uh, check that out. Thank you. Um, one more. Yeah, one more. All right, one more. Uh, just a note for the ARM64 case. Although does have support for quite a number of uh, ARM64 processes. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, going back to the question about ARM64 support, uh, this gentleman raised the point that Corboot does support ARM64. Um, Ubu also supports a lot of ARM64 platforms. So I mean, they're both great open source projects. And it would be great to have them both uh, you know, able to boot into Linux and take advantage of uh, 